Good morning. Let's praise God. Praise nobody you. like we you. We lift your name, Lord. Thank God, you are mighty. You're mighty. Lord, 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 you're mighty.
Let's pray together. God, we thank you for another day, a day we haven't seen before and a day that we will never see again. Lord, because of this gift that you have given us, we worship you. We ask that you might take residence in this worship experience, this time of praise and community, that you might invade this time and change us on the inside until it shows up on the outside, Lord, because we recognize that when your son, Jesus Christ, is lifted up, that he would draw all men unto him. So do as you see fit to glorify yourself in this moment. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray amen and amen. Refuge Church, let's worship together. Good morning, Refuge family. This is the time in our service where we pass the peace. This is where we show the love of Christ to everyone within our circle. So if you don't mind, take out your phone and text somebody. Let them know that you've been thinking about them. Let them know that you've been praying for them. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel and like us on Facebook. And put a comment there in the comment section. Let us know how you're doing. Let us know how we're doing. So, let's pass the peace refuge. God bless you. Happy Graduation Sunday. This is Pastor Jay. Listen, whether you are finishing and graduating preschool and into kindergarten, or whether you're going from kindergarten to the first grade, or whether you're going from elementary school and graduating into middle school, whether you're graduating middle school, going to high school, whether you are a high school graduate or a college graduate, or you've received your master's degree or your certification, or even your doctorate, may I speak God's blessings upon your life and upon where you are going. Listen, an education is a precious thing. Uh, The people that we came from, they wanted this for us. They prayed for it. They sometimes had to hide and break the law for it. And yet here we are, recipients of their hard work, their prayers, and we get to walk in. And so don't ever stop. Don't ever stop learning. Don't ever stop working. Don't ever be ashamed of your education, but ask that God would use this education now that you are in this realm, that he would make you a blessing for other people around you, other people behind you, other people even higher than you, that what God has given you in this education, that you use it to be a blessing and to bring about God's glory and God's will on the earth through you and through your family. So I speak blessings on you and may God bless you. May God keep you, uh, keep on going. Don't ever stop until you get all the education that you feel like you need to walk in the fullness of what God has purposed for your life. Uh, I'm, I'm a living witness that God can take somebody who barely made it through and struggled and God can do great things through that education that God is giving you and that you have achieved. So may God order your steps as you walk in the fullness of what it means to be one who has finished one level of education and looking forward to another. May God bless you, may God keep you, I love you, and there's nothing that you can do about it, and it must be true because I'm a doctor. Bless you, love you guys.
Good morning, good morning, good morning, City of Refuge. It is a privilege to come and share with you. I am so honored this day uh, to come and, and share with you virtually with the uh, City of Refuge family. You are a tremendous church. My very, 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 very good friend, prayer partner, 
Pastor Jeremy Upton, Dr. Pastor Jeremy Upton. Uh, I surely appreciate him and value him, his spirit, his leadership, his incredible theological mind and vision. And I am always enriched with the nuggets he drops on our prayer calls on Sunday morning. To Bree and the entire Upton family, I hope you're doing well. It is a blessing to come share with you. I can't wait for the time when we can reconnect and see each other face to face. But in the meantime, the Lord has a way of making a way. And so I'm just, again, glad to come and share with you uh, what the Lord has laid on my heart that I hope is really a blessing for you and the Refuge family. So let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, we bless you and just thank you so much again for this time. Thank you so much for the Refuge Church. Thank you for the leadership of my good friend, your man, Jeremy Upton, his wonderful wife and family and all that you're doing uh, in that community. I lift them up, God, for your next forward moment for them. May this word find a resting place for your people that we might be the strong and the cross may be lifted up in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. I, I want to share with you what I shared with our church that I believe is critical at this moment. Uh, the times that we're in, uh, society is reopening, people are returning. I noticed that uh, a lot of the uh, stadiums, uh, whether it's uh, the basketball stadiums or I know the Indianapolis 500, all these places were just maxed out over the Memorial weekend. And there's a sense that the culture is trying to return back to the way life was. And I want to lift up this word that I hope is an encouragement for you, because I do believe it signals a move of God uh, that I believe is critical uh, for us. And so I want to invite your attention to uh, Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 5, the New Living Translation, Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. And here's how it reads. Saul was one of the witnesses, and he agreed completely with the killing of Stephen. A great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem. And all the believers except the apostles were scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria. Some devout men came and buried Stephen with great mourning. But Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them into prison. But the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Philip, for example, went to the city of Samaria and told the people there about the disciple, about, about the Messiah, excuse me, the, the Christ or the Messiah. And I want to talk about the forward moment, the forward moment. And by forward moment, here's what I mean. We may be going, we may be going back, we may be coming back, but we're not going back. We're going forward. Let me say that again. I got a little tongue tied. We may be coming back. That is, we're coming back as a society. We're coming back as a church family. We're coming back to our places of gathering and fellowship. Uh, but we're not going back. We're not going back to the way things used to be. We're going forward. And so I want to talk about the forward moment, the forward moment. Our text raises the question this morning, how do we handle a forward moment? Because whatever else I've discovered in our walk with God, God will bring us to what I call a forward moment. What is a forward moment? It's quite simple. Everything on the one hand is telling you to chill, hedge your bets. While on the other hand, God is saying, no, don't hedge your, spe your, de your bets. You got to step forward. In other words, the forward moment is that time when common sense tells you one thing, but God has a way of pulling your collar and said, no, we're going in another direction. And I believe what we're seeing today more than ever before, that this is a forward moment for the church. It is a forward moment for the followers of Jesus. It is a forward moment for your families, your children. It is a forward moment for your business. This is not the time to hedge our bets, to play it safe, to hunker down. No, God has brought us to a forward moment. And that's really the sense in our text. In our text, this is, this is where the church was. Stephen, a, a beloved leader in the church, a deacon, had been viciously slaughtered by the, uh, the, the Apostle Paul, who at the time was Saul. And yet God used that moment in a moment of trauma, in a moment of great persecution against the church to actually move the church forward. 
Matter of fact, if we're going to be consistent with the work of Jesus Christ, what was experienced in Acts chapter 8 was actually spoken by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 where he says, You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. And the church had gotten comfortable and wanted to stay in Jerusalem rather than moving in Samaria. And in a sense, that's what we do. There's a sense we can easily just kind of sit tight when things are not going our way. When persecution, hard times, and difficulty show up on our doorstep, we either sit there or we'll even go back to our old ways. We'll go back to old experiences. We'll go back to old places. We'll even go back to old songs trying to reminisce the old days as if somehow we can bring back some of our youth from the past. <laughs> we even go back to sinful behaviors we don't mean to, but the trauma and the persecution causes us to pause. And by pausing, we end up reverting back to some old behaviors that God had brought us out of. And some of us, if we'll be honest, we'll even go back to the old flames. We'll check those Facebook pages and Instagram pages of people we haven't talked to in 30 years. Preach, Autry. Because something happens when we experience persecution or trauma or we experience a difficult place like we've experienced with the pandemic. There's a temptation to go back. But what I love about this text that even though the people of God saw their beloved Stephen be uh, martyred and, and, and murdered, even though the church was going through persecution, God wouldn't let them go back. The text says that he scattered them into Samaria and other regions. That we serve a God that won't let you go back. And I know some of you watching today, you can testify. There were some times you did go back and God brought you out of what you went back to. But there were some times you tried to go back and God says, no, we ain't going back. <laughs> I'm so glad I serve a God that even in my heart of hearts that sometimes I want to go back to something that I know is not good for me. But God is so great. God is so powerful. He will overpower my will and say, no, we're not going back. Would you type that in the chat? Would you tell somebody we are not going back because we serve a God who won't let us go back? Therefore, the question that we are faced this morning, I think, is really important, even though everything in our hearts our minds and sometimes in our soul just want to just hedge our bets, remain where we are, or even go back to the way things used to be. How do we handle what looks like a go back moment, which in reality is a forward moment? <laughs> and surely again, as I said earlier, the recent mass mandate, the lifting of the mandate, I don't know about Florida, but even in Texas here, we got similar crazy uh, politicians. <laughs> it is a word that maybe it's time <laughs> that the forward moment is happening in our country. Uh, returning to in-person services is a time that it is a forward moment. Our need for human engagement is a forward moment. I am 100% convinced that online ministry is here. I'm convinced that God used the pandemic in a way to shift the church deeper into the online ministry waters than we had planned. Some of us were playing on the beach. Some of us were, were straddling uh, shallow waters. But God now has pushed us into the deep waters of the virtual world. And God was using that. And yet in the midst of that, we've discovered that we need that human engagement. We need that contact. We, we need to see each other. And we miss that. There's something supernatural that happens when we come together. There's a place for pajama praise. There's a place for the hallelujah hairdos in the morning. But there's nothing that can replace the, the presence of God when we are together as God's people. It is indeed a forward moment. It's a forward moment for our marriages and family. And if it's one thing that we discovered in the pandemic, I'm convinced of this, is that our marriages and families are not what we proclaim them to be. God put us in a situation where we could be around each other 24 seven. And if you remember in the pre-pandemic, we missed everything. We missed church, we missed important events, all in the name of family. And God gave us what we wanted. We had family time, marriage time. And we couldn't even stand to be around each other for 15 minutes. And what looked like everything was fine on the outside, we discovered that things were not the way they were. This is indeed a forward moment. It's definitely a forward moment for many of our careers. We talked about if you like the City of Refuge and like the Christ Community Church, we are now a hybrid ministry. 
We've got to do ministry not only in person, but we got to continue ministry online. And God is trying to push us and stretch us in ways we've never been stretched before because God knows he can get more out of us. But many of you watching, you've had to become hybrid supervisors. You've had to become hybrid managers and hybrid CV CEOs and hybrid uh, uh, business people. Some of you dads and moms, you've had to become hybrid moms and dads. I got some educators that are probably watching and some medical people watching. You had to become a hybrid nurse or a hybrid teacher because now you had to not only do your job in the virtual world, you had to be still the same person and even better in the in-person world. This is indeed a forward moment. We have come to a forward moment and the question is, how do we handle the forward moment? And you may not have all the answers. You may not have all your bases covered. You may not have all your cue cards down, but I believe the forward moment is simple and this is how God moves. He always moves. The only thing you can do is step into the forward moment. That's my thesis. That's my word. I hope that you get it for today more than anything, even when you don't understand it, even when everything says you ought to go back, even when everything says you ought to hedge your bets and hold your cards close to your chest. I believe God is saying to you and I, we've got to step into the forward moment. We, we've got to take the, the opportunity that is before us and use it as a way to expand what God is doing in our personal life and more importantly, what God is doing in our ministries and for the kingdom. This is a forward moment. Step into it. Step into it. And so this really became crystal clear for me recently on a trip in which I went to see my mother for Mother's Day. My mom and dad, they're both doing well. My dad is 86 and he is doing very, very well, walks every day, just blessed. My mom is 83, she's doing well. She has not been sick a day in her life. So I went to see them for Mother's Day because last year this time when we went virtual, I said online, they watch me every Sunday, that I'm coming to see my mother for Mother's Day and I wanted to be a son that kept his word. So I went to see my mother for Mother's Day. My wife went along with me and lo and behold, when we got to the airport in Dallas, I was surprised because my wife and I were American Airlines longtime Advantage members. They upgraded our seats from coach to first class. And I said, well, Lord, you know what? Who am I to argue with you if you want to go ahead and upgrade me? I said, upgrade me in the name of Jesus. And so we rode, we flew from Dallas to Mobile because my parents live in Alabama. We flew from Dallas to Mobile first class and we had a great trip. It was uh, turbulence free, wonderful service. It was a great experience, except when we landed on the tarmac, y'all, we sat out there for almost an hour. You would think that maybe the reason why we set out there was because there was another plane ahead of us. That was not the problem. Why are we sitting on the tarmac? It was not because another plane was ahead of us. It was not, not because of air traffic. Y'all, this was a small port. This was Mobile, Alabama. It was a very small airport. Why were we sitting on the tarmac? Here it is. There was a pilot on the plane that was sitting a few rows behind us. And he said, I know exactly why you're sitting on the tarmac. He says, the plane we're flying in is a little bit bigger than what they're used to. And they're trying to figure out how can they adjust and, and, and fix everything so that they can receive a plane this size. In other words, here was a moment for the airport, which was a forward moment in which God, which, which someone was sending something bigger to them, but because they were not ready, they almost missed what was coming their way. I wish I can preach this like I want to. I don't know about you who are watching, but I've decided I'm not going to miss my forward moment. I want everything that God has for me. And God is a God that many times in our forward moment, if we position ourselves, he will send something that is bigger and better that will bless us in a way that we never dreamed of. I am not going to miss my forward moment. And so my word to you is step into this forward moment. Would you type that in the chat? Step into your forward moment. So how do we navigate that? And how does God move us in there? There's a couple of things I want to share very, very quickly. I should say actually a few things I want to share as we look at how the church, the early church navigated their forward. I mean, here's the first one. Number one, you got to learn from your losses. You got to learn from your losses. And if there's one thing that we can agree upon together is that the pandemic produced a lot of loss from us, a lot of loss, loss of life, loss of routine that just threw a lot of us off. Uh, people lost income. Uh, kids lost valuable cl 
classroom time. Uh, families and friends went through difficulty. I mean, it was a very, very difficult time. A, a lot of loss. Uh, it was a very, very tough time. But understand that most the most productive forward moments comes on the heels of significant loss. When you look at the terrain of Scripture, that many times the greatest moments and move of God, they come on the heels of loss. Maybe you remember Isaiah the prophet. He had just lost his friend Uzziah. And the Bible says after he lost his friend Uzziah, he went to church. And I don't know who was preaching that way. I don't know what the songs that were sung. But in that moment, he saw the Lord high and lifted up. And because he saw the Lord high and lifted up, guess what? God called him to be a prophet to the nations, and that became his forward moment. And all I'm suggesting to us today is that our most significant forward moments many times happens on the heels of loss. The text says that Saul completely agreed with the killing of Stephen. Deacon Stephen was a beloved leader in this church, and Saul killed him. And then he stepped up the killing by persecuting innocent Christians. They lost homes, y'all. They lost families were split up and they lost friends. People were put in jail for no reason. And yet God said in the moment which we should retreat, he says, no, 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 no. This is the moment that we should move forward. And the loss became the church's greatest moment. I know this is tough to bear, but listen to me this morning. Learning from your losses in no form or fashion minimizes the loss you've experienced. Hear me, because when I talk about learning from loss, I know it hurts. Loss hurts. And learning from them in no way indicates that as Christians, God is saying you can minimize or you just need to move on. This is not a word that, look, it's time to move on. It's time to stop crying over what happened to you. Everybody go through stuff. No, this is not that kind of word. Matter of fact, I want you to look at the text uh, very closely. It says that the devout men who buried Stephen, they wept very loudly. One translation says with loud uh, lamentations that they actually grieved. And when we go through loss, whether it's friends or family or whether it's job or whether it's time or relationships, it doesn't matter. There is a place to grieve. There is a place to pour our hearts before God and to pour out our hearts to those who love us that we may experience the comfort of God. It was Jesus who, Jesus who said, blessed are they that are comforted for they, sh that's, I'm sorry, blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. There's a sense in the text that it's not until we mourn that we can experience the comfort of God. And so we have not sinned when we mourn. We have not sinned when we grieve. There's surely a place for that. But in your grieving process, hear me today, you got to keep it moving eventually. I'm not saying that somehow you shouldn't grieve. I'm not saying that somehow uh, you shouldn't pause and give yourself time. All I'm saying is when you grieve, take a handkerchief with you. Don't, don't sit in one place too long. David said, yea, do I walk through the valley? In other words, David says, I'm not camping out in the valley. I'm not building a house in the valley. I don't plan to stay in the valley. The valley is a place of pain, trauma, and grief. But I'm not going to stay there as long as God is with me. I'm going to walk through the valley. Is there anybody know that God will walk with you through your greatest grief? And so in those moments, we got to keep it moving. Moving. If you've lost a loved one, keep on walking because the Lord will comfort you. If you lost a job, keep on walking because the Lord will provide a new job in his time. If you lost a relationship, keep on walking. The Lord is the one who sticks closer than a brother and he will heal your broken heart. And yes, even if you've lost your faith, keep on walking because God will meet you at the place where you lost your faith, pick you up and carry him. Is there anybody know God will walk with you in your greatest difficulty? He'll do that. Walk, walk with God, keep on moving, learn from those losses, but also to walk the path and principles of wisdom and particularly those who have gone before us. Because I get the question from time to time, Pastor, it hurts so bad, how do I move forward? It isn't easy. And I'm not here to tell you that it's gonna get easier. The truth is we learn to live with our losses, but God supernaturally has a way of using the worst loss to make us stronger, uh, to make us wiser, uh, to give us clarity on our purpose, and to give us even a bigger heart 
to minister to those who may be going through similar circumstances. And so in those moments, what we do, we simply capture or learn the values of those who had gone before us. There's a sense in the text, that's what exactly happened. When Stephen fell down or Stephen was murdered, it was Philip that would step up in verse five. And Philip would carry the torch of the deaconship of that church that Stephen laid down. And the best thing we can do, particularly when it comes to people we love, it's their convictions, it's their values, it's their principles that we gotta hold on to. My heart breaks because during the pandemic, we lost some wonderful seniors. And one thing that they believed in, y'all, they believed in going to church. And I want you to hear me, I'm all for online ministry, I'm all for that, whatever it takes to do discipleship, that is clearly where God is trying to take the church. <laughs> But it cannot replace that in-person uh, ministry. It cannot replace that in-person worship. Y'all, we need that. That's what makes us strongest. We can see today, particularly with Naomi Osaki, this, this unprecedented surge in mental health awareness. It is real, y'all. And surely I would never uh, take away from the importance of education, of the importance of therapy and talking to someone. Some of you listening right now get delivered from the shame. Listen, I've been to counseling for my own anger issues. I'm a 100% better person. Don't think that somehow something's wrong with your faith or something's wrong with you because you seek out some help with some mental health awareness. But I will say this, all that's good, we ought to do that. But let me tell you something, when you know you got God's people on your side and when you're in the presence of other people who love you and who are part of the family of God, God has a way of giving us peace in the midst of sorrow. God has a way of giving us joy for our tomorrow. Is there anybody know that there's nothing that can replace the fellowship of his saints? Number one, we got to learn from our losses. Number two, we got to lean into new possibilities. Trouble and loss are God's opportunity to unleash the treasures that are on the inside that we never knew were there. Look at verse one, he says, all the believers except the apostles were scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria. I love the word here that Luke chooses to describe this forward movement that God gives to the church. He uses the word worse, actually the phrase worse scattered. It's what is called a divine passive which means on the surface level, it looks like the devil or evil men are making this thing happen. But underneath, it is God who is engineering it for his purpose, that it may look bad on the top side, but underneath God is working it for good for his purpose. And I don't know who that word is. It may look dark outside right now, but Sunday morning is coming your way. Hold on to what God has for your life. But then also too, the word scattered is literally the word choice seed of all the words that Luke could have chosen. He chose seed. It's the same word that Jesus used when he preached his parables uh, in Matthew 13. The sower went out to sow seed, scatter seed. And the idea is that you and I, we are seed to be planted in productive soil. And sometimes God has to shake it up in such a way to shake up what's on the inside that wants to germinate and produce greater fruit. And many times it takes persecution, trauma, to realize the deep intrinsic value that God has invested in me. I'll be honest with you, more than anything, personally, I never knew the pandemic would spawn my introduction into video production as it has. Since February of 2020 of last year, y'all, I have produced more videos in that year and a half than I could have ever even imagined. I got my own studio in my house. I got a studio at my church. And y'all, I've got into this video thing. Matter of fact, that's my new superpower for you superhero fans. I do the video thing. My wife will tell you that boy thinks he's Steven Spielberg. But it took the pandemic for God to shift me to recognize there was something latent in me that I didn't know was there. And I actually get excited now to share educational videos and content with my congregation and other individuals that they may grow in the word. But it had not, if it had not been for the pandemic, that never would have happened. And that's what God does in our forward moment. 
He, he pushes us in places to reveal something deeper on the inside that we didn't know was even there. And this is a forward moment. People ask the question, what does God want me to do? Many times you got to step out of the shallow water and go into the deep waters and trust God and just try something new to give it a test and to see what God says. This is definitely a forward moment in, in terms of discipleship that God is calling us that if we're truly his followers, church, listen to me, City of Refuge, that we've got to learn that discipleship is about investing in others what God has poured in us. And we know what discipleship is because a lot of us, even right now on social media, we got our own Facebook followers, we got our own Instagram followers, we got our own YouTube followers. And here's my question, if you can get all those social media followers, is it possible that God wants you to get some Christ followers that you can invest in and make a difference in their life? This is indeed a forward moment for family. And I tell you, the pandemic, I learned a lot about family and marriage. But more importantly, boy, I, I learned I got the best wife on the planet. Uh, she is very, very special. And I appreciate her so much as she was concerned about the stability of our family. That, that was very, very critical for her. And, and I'm saying all this right now because we're not fighting, right? And she would agree with me. But right now, things are cool. So we say that nicely. But seriously, uh, she blessed our family tremendously. Um, uh, during the pandemic, I got two sons actually who are actually out of the house. Praise the Lord. <laughs> They're out of the house. They've been out of the house for five to seven years or so. Uh, but more importantly, we wanted to stay connected with, with them. At least Lisa wanted to do that. And what she did, she organized every Monday at six o'clock. We still do it to this day. We do a Zoom call for about 30 minutes. And all we do is just check in on each other. How you doing emotionally? How you doing in general? How's the job doing? How's your health? What are your plans? What are your dreams? Any issues we need to know about? Just want to know how you're doing. Can I pray for you? And, and that moment has been invaluable for us as a family. It's helped us keep some measure of connection. Uh, it, it's definitely helped us keep a sense of love and feel the love, even though we're in two different cities. And we need that. Whether we do it once a week, whether we do it every day, we need a time. Uh, couples and family with children uh, where we just connect and we do it drama free, drama free. This is not a time to bring up drama. This is not a time to bring up the conflict. This is not a time to bring up all your differences, the money issues. This is not a time to jump on your kids as to why they didn't make up their bed. This is not the time. No, this is a time to be relaxed. Let your hair down a little bit. Let's just see how each other's doing. It's a safe place. Say what's on your heart. What do you need our support for? What do you need to be? Where do you need to be encouraged? Where do you need to know that we're proud of you? That that's what this is. It's not a time to get on each other as to why you, uh, the husband is not cooking or the wife is not cooking. No, this is a time where you really connect. It's it's definitely a forward moment. And then I would argue this has definitely been a forward moment for our leadership and surely for your leadership. And for us, uh, it's a time in which we're doing everything to expand our leadership structure, but also to pass it on to a younger generation. I'll be 60 this year and, and I plan to pastor for maybe a few more years. I don't plan to be 85 and still in the pulpit. I tell my church all the time, y'all ain't got to say, look at his old behind. He know he need to get out the pulpit. Y'all ain't going to say that about me. I said that to my church. They're not going to say that about me. But we're trying to do that even now. We're trying to transition the church to prepare the church for what God wants to do in the future. And I'm proud to say that we're going to be ordaining 11 men and women to ministry and as deacons. And it's very, very exciting. And that stands as a symbol for the church for all the other leadership positions that we want people to be involved in, all the other different ministries, whether it's Christian education, benevolence, outreach, our justice ministry, all the different ministries. We want to give our young people an opportunity, our media, our tech, all that kind of stuff. We want to give them an opportunity. And surely for you, City of Refuge, you got to think about the future. This is an opportunity to let others and to expand your ministry. Doesn't mean you got to replace people. You don't even have to do that, but expand your structure and take advantage of that moment. Well, I've held you too long. Let me give you the last one. The last one, we learn from our losses. <laughs> uh, we do everything to learn from our losses. More than anything, we lean into new possibilities. And then number three, here's my last one. We want to leverage new territories. We want to leverage new territories. And that's exactly what happened in our text. Verse five says, Philip, for example, went to the city of Samaria and told the people there about the Messiah or the Christ. 
And as we stated earlier, this is really to underscore what Jesus preached in Acts chapter 2, verse 8. <laughs> you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and it becomes a reality. They actually fulfill it. They go into new territories. And surely that's been your experience. That's been the experience of every church. You've had to go into new territories. We talked about that hybrid experience. Now the church is a hybrid reality. We are into the virtual world, but we got to go into other territories. It's just the beginning. And we've got to be open to that. we got a lot of ministry to do, a lot of opportunities. No crisis or major turning points or pivots in uh, human history is not a time that we hunker down. It's not a time to hedge our bets. No, this is the moment that we step into the forward moment and we trust God for what he's doing. In the same way Israel had to step foot into the River Jordan, trusting God to part the waters, we too got to step into our forward moment, knowing that God will part whatever barriers are before us. He'll make a way so that we can make a difference. I want to close with this, something very personal. I Many of you may not know, but about eight months, 10 months ago, I had what was called a pulmonary embolism. That is, I had blood clots in my left lung and my right lung. My left lung was completely filled with a blood clot. My right lung was partially filled. I struggled to breathe. My wife had to rush me to the hospital early in the morning because I could barely breathe and really thought I was gonna lose my life. Doctor, when I tell doctors, they look at me like I'm crazy and can't believe I survived it. I am a living miracle, y'all. And I'm gonna be honest with you, it took me a while to even process that experience as it really affected me because I came so close to losing my life. Well, recently they analyzed my blood because they wanted to get down to the root as to why I had a pulmonary embolism. Because nothing in my health history, nothing in my current health would suggest that I should have had a pulmonary embolism. They said I was in great health, not just good health, but great health. And really this should not be happening to you. So after they ran the test, they actually took 12 vials of blood, had a little dizzy spell for a minute, but we're good. They took 12 vials of blood from me and did an extensive analysis of my blood. And my doctor told me, he says, not only is your blood good, your blood is absolutely great. It looks good. He says, to be honest with you, we have no explanation whatsoever as to why you had a pulmonary embolism. Uh, sometimes he says, scientists doesn't know it all. Aren't you glad science doesn't know everything? I'm so glad God knows everything. And so he said, for, for the most part, uh, you look good. I said, so what are you telling me? And this is what he said. He says, brother, you got a lot of living to do. And that was a word to me. That, that was God's way of telling me, step into your full moment, Archer. You don't have to be hesitant. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be scared. Even though you had this traumatic event in your life, I got so much more for you. I got so much coming your way. I'm bringing something bigger your way. And that's my word to you, City of Refuge. Don't you pause. Don't you hedge your bets. Don't you hold your spiritual cards close to your chest. No, step into your forward moment. Step into what God has for your life. Step into the opportunity that God has before you as a church. Don't hedge. Don't be afraid. Do it together and God will bless it significantly because this is your forward moment. God bless you, uh, City of Refuge. Uh, God bless you, Pastor Upton. You know you my friend. You my dude. Love you much. Love you and Bree big time, your entire family. Know I'll be seeing you real soon. Can't wait till we can fellowship and catch up again. Be talking to you soon. Take care. As is our custom, we pause to worship Jesus in this moment of Holy Communion. So if you have your receptacles, if you have them available, let's take a time and uh, spend some time in personal confession of sin uh, in asking Jesus to forgive us, to make, put us in right alignment with him, asking that he would be present with us uh, in the symbols of these elements, that we might keep his word, keep his command, that we might gather together and rightly partake, rightly align with what it means to be a part of the body of Christ. So let's take a moment. And let's confess our sin. Let's get our hearts right before God in this time of Holy Communion. Lord Jesus, we thank you for what you were willing to do for us. Thank you, Jesus, that you left all that 
you had, all that you uh, were, was a part of what it meant to be surrounded by worship and angels and service for all eternity past. And you took on these human suits and all the frailties and all the weaknesses that come with it. And yet you chose to live a sinless life. You chose to that which pleased God and not that which pleased your flesh. And you did it so that you could be the perfect sacrificial lamb for our sins. You allowed your creation to nail you to a cross, to beat you, to execute you for something you did not do. But your word says that it was for our iniquities that you were bruised. It was the chastisement of our peace, the, the penalty for us to have peace of mind and peace with God. You paid it all. And for that, we're grateful. But then you didn't just stay dead. You rose from the dead on that third day that you might show us that we could walk in victory over sin, self, and Satan. And we thank you. Now we ask that in these next few moments as we consecrate our hearts and as we prepare these elements that you would forgive us of our sin, that you would wash away our iniquity. We confess that it was against you and you only that we've sinned and done evil in your sight. We've sinned in action. We've sinned in thought and in attitude. And we confess them all now to you. We ask that you would uh, see us through the lenses of the sacrifice of Jesus and that we could be rightly be made right with you once again. Consecrate these elements now. It's just a little cracker and some juice, but it reminds us of what Jesus was willing to pay that we might be made right with God for all eternity. And for all of that, we say thank you. We bless you and we magnify you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now the Bible says that Jesus on that night took bread. He blessed it and he broke it before he gave it to them. He says, this represents my body, which will be broken for you. He was broken to put us back together again. Let's take and eat together. The Bible says in the same manner, Jesus took the cup the, 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 the wine representing his blood. He said, this is my blood, which will be shed for the remission, the removing of men's sins. He said, this is the blood of a brand new covenant. I'm making a brand new deal with you. That's why what can wash away our sin, the songwriter says, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Let's take and drink together. And the Bible says that when we do this when we pause when we humble ourselves before God as we're reminded of our bonding together as one body in Christ if we're if we would celebrate and look forward to where God is taking us as a people because of the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 there exists the power among us for healing for the curse of sin and death to be reversed and so as a point of contact just stretch your hand toward your screen to toward your device and I decree and declare based upon our obedience to the word of God and based upon what our Jesus has done and accomplished for us. I declare and decree healing, wholeness and deliverance in mind, body and spirit in Jesus name. Amen. Somebody ought to give God praise right off down through there. Listen, it's offering time in the house. It's time to bless God with our gifts of tithe, offering, or love offering. As you know, there's four different ways that you can give. We want to try to make it easy for you to worship God in giving. Your living is forgiving, but that's why God has blessed in such a way. Now listen, if you don't have anything to give, if this is your first time worshiping with us, we ask you, please don't worry about this part. But for those of us that know, for those of us that God has been good to, for those of us who are partners, we know of our responsibility to bless God with our gifts of tithe, offering, or love offering. As you prepare those gifts, remember that you give as unto the Lord. And there's an old saying they used to have in the old church that you can't beat God's giving no matter how hard you try. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to worship you in giving. Thank you, O oh God, that you have continued to provide for all of our needs according to your riches in glory. And now, God, we share back with you to say thank you. We share back with you because we love you. We share back with you because we want you to know that we recognize that we are, have been put into a covenant relationship with you. 
and we want to follow you with all of our life, with all of our strength, and even with our substance. And so now, God, I pray that you would do what you promised in your word, and that you would open up the windows of heaven, pour out blessings, give grace upon grace, and make your name known and shine through us, even as we give from our living. Lord, we love you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship Him in giving. Watch these announcements. Listen, thank you so much for worshiping with us. May God bless you. May God keep you is my prayer. I love you. There's nothing that you can do about it. Let's walk without labels into this next week. Can I pray for us? Father, we bless you. We thank you. We magnify you for the freedom that you give us in Jesus Christ. Thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit in us. Now, God, empower us to cooperate with you as you remove the labels, as you remove the obstacles, as you prepare us for the destiny that you called us to. We give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise. And now God, may the choices, benediction and blessings rest upon your people as we are about your business this week. In Jesus' name, amen. May God bless you overflowing in your life. May God keep you, may the peace of God rest upon you.